Catherine and I always get to do a test of I have the pleasure of kicking off this panel by introducing its moderator, Aaron Betsky. Uh, Aaron is well known to all of us through all the times we read his name. He is a correspondent for the Los Angeles Times, Metropolitan Home, ID Magazine, and Architectural Record. And he has taught at Cal Poly, Art Center College of Design, O School of Art and Design, and is now at Southern California Institute of Architecture. He has worked for Hodgetts and Fung, for Frank Gehry, and he went to school at Yale. So we hope, Aaron, that all of this is a pricey for the East and West, or East, not versus West, but the kind of dialogue that we hope to get going. Uh, he is also, uh, very importantly to this, a uh, co-founder of the Los Angeles Forum for Architecture and Urban Design, and he is going to continue the spirited discussion of uh, public space by focusing now our attention on extending those streets into the open spaces. And welcome, Aaron. We look forward to it. Uh, thank you, Marilyn. And I'm honored to be speaking or moderating uh, such an august uh, group of people. But I must say I feel a little at a loss because when I was first contacted and asked to get involved with this, I was asked to speak about public space, which is great, except that I really can't stand that term. I have a lot of trouble in the belief in some great thing called public space that is supposed to be the raison d'etre uh, for all great cities, that you cannot have a great city unless you have this thing called public space, which preferably should not be a shopping mall, as we've, as we've heard before, because that's private, which makes it evil, and it should preferably have lots of sidewalks, because that means they're pedestrian, and that's good, and somehow public space means public discourse, and that will make us citizens in a great kind of urban version of the Jeffersonian democracy. Well, as far as I'm concerned, that's a bunch of baloney, um, and I hope that the panel today will offer us a few alternatives to that kind of standard way of thinking about public space. But just as by way of introduction, I would propose to you that public space is actually, uh, the idea of public space is actually a historical phenomenon of a fairly recent date and emerged in the 19th century when a new group of people that we today call the middle class found that they needed to appropriate, define, and build their own space and thus took over a series of forecourts to palaces and cathedrals, marketplaces, and transportation corridors. And through the efforts of members of their own group, namely architects, planners, engineers, uh, tried to turn those into places that represented their particular value system and their particular needs. Justifying this activity through an appeal to classical virtues of civitas and of a public nature, and pretending that the democratic city would actually be a place that would revolve around plazas where discourse would take place. Of course, that never happened. The public life of cities occurs either in those spaces that has been specifically institutionalized to allow it to occur, say, parliament buildings, or it occurs in spaces that are often violently appropriated for that use, the space behind the barricade, the street that's taken over during a demonstration, all the other uh, small spaces that Margaret alluded to that are taken over by those people excluded from the power structure of the city. The next level of justification for these kind of public spaces becomes one that is, if you will, pseudo-scientific or abstract and argues that what is needed in a city, and this is sort of the New York turn of the century argument, is light and space and just sheer unplanned space, that we need some place to breathe, that we need some place that will keep the germs from multiplying because the sunlight will bake them out, as was once thought, that we need parks, that we need some place that is not built up and that we should justify this space because everything has 
to, in a rational society, have a justification through, as I said, a kind of scientific argument about the necessity of light and space and openness for the correct functioning of a modern city. And it's interesting to me to note that a class of people, uh, many of whom are present here, uh, made this part of their agenda that what we need is a group of people who control the venal private interest who would otherwise just put up lots of buildings, whether shopping malls or office buildings or houses, and we need to constrain them through good design. We need to open up a space, a space of what essentially I would say a space of planning, a kind of self-justifying place of planning. Now, that does not mean that we need, we don't need open space to have a good city or a just city. That doesn't mean that I would argue that we should pave over every park and that we should allow, take, off, take away all density bonuses and allow shopping malls to take over every street, nor should we put a freeway where every sidewalk is. I would merely argue that we need to be much more specific about what it is that we want to do with open space. What can it be used for? How does space that is not a building or a road, how does it become an asset to the good and just city? And I would argue that the panelists today will give us some concrete examples of what that city can be, that space can be used for. Certainly it can be used as a space that reveals the nature of the city and the geography of that city, both man-made and natural, to us and allows us to understand where we are in a quite literal, sensual, and one would hope dramatic sense. It can be a productive part of our society which expropriates those spaces which are usually reserved from those who have garnished enough power to control them and allows people to use their own skills, whether as street vendors or as uh, tenders of gardens, to create something within them. They can be a kind of area of connection that not only allows us physically to get from one place to the other, but allows us to create connections with other people. And finally, it can be in either an abstract or a symbolic sense, a place that represents us, that not, represents us not just as individuals, but represents us as a group or as a series of different groups, and thus uh, can have a series of rather fluid, but one would hope, communal definitions. Definitions that might not allow us to enter them, that might not, in fact, be things that are productive, but that allow us to be productive in other arenas, perhaps the private arena. The uh, members of the panel that I hope will address some of these issues are, first of all, Pamela Burton, who uh, is a landscape architect and head of the Burton Company. And uh, second uh, is Brenda Funches, who is the founder and director of the group LA Harvest and one of the prime leaders in the movement in Los Angeles for community gardens. Uh, third, we will be hearing from Bill Fain, who you all know about at this point, so I no longer have to introduce him, except that he took the admirable step when the economy caused a downturn in his office to not send everyone home, but actually think about what you could do uh, with open spaces in Los Angeles, and he'll be talking to us about that. And then finally, we will hear from Jeremy Gilbert Rolfe, who is an artist and the, though I wasn't supposed to say this, the founder of October Magazine, uh, and will produce a, uh, the, the latest collection of his essays will come out this October. Um, he is also the chair of the art department uh, at Art Center College of Design. And with that, I would like to give the microphone over to Pamela Burton. In the wake of our periodic, uh, we go. in the wake of our periodic natural disasters, and in the wake of our increasing urban congestion and violence, how should architects and landscape architects rethink the idea of open space? 
While the practical and political aspects of open space always have to be dealt with, I would also like to think about its psychological importance and how open space can be integrated into the narratives which landscapes provide. Thinking of landscapes as providing scripts for social and psychological interactions, both private and public, today I want to suggest that we need to integrate these functional requirements with what William Irwin Thompson calls an ecology of the mind. Just as, <coughs> excuse me, just as physical ecologies, the physical ecologies require balance that comes from diversity, such as marshes and deserts, oceans and continents, fire and flood, so too our mental ecologies require a balance of politics and mythologies defensive architecture, symbolic resonance, conventional sanity, and <coughs> schizophrenia. Can you turn the slides on, please? Both of you together. Further, we were able to cultivate. 
form of the Los Angeles River, which is then concreted over, not to allow for any um, water to percolate back through to the um, aquifer and to recharge the aquifer. There are also other elements um, which impact the open space and impact the um, exterior of, of buildings. I want to read that because talking, responding directly to what Aaron has spoken about, what, do the, what does the open space become in Los Angeles and how do we read it and how is it, how is it affecting the um, things that designers need to include in their understanding of these spaces. And the way that fire transforms the landscape is something that needs to be uh, incorporated as well as uh, other environmental uh, concerns. And those environmental concerns have also to do with uh, recent earthquakes and also uh, massive uh, Pacific uh, storms that come over Los Angeles in sequence. And what the impact of those things are to, to the edges um, the edges of urban development, the edges of our natural native uh, environment. This is a storm off of the uh, Pacific Coast, and this is the same uh, area I'm looking at on a calm day. The incredible amount of runoff that comes from the canyons has, of course, not been increased with the recent uh, fire storms. How our canyons are treated and how we uh, relate to the degradation of our open canyons, how the city of Los Angeles, which has an incredible sense of topography, has been hidden or covered over in a way by increasing, by grading and by changing of the topography, but that there are ways in which the open space can still be read. And that open space is not just necessarily um, public space. It can also be the uh, <coughs> private space, private yards, and private areas. As you uh, stand at the in this house and look out over uh, Hollywood, you see Barnesville Park in the, mm -hmm. this mountain coming out of the middle of the grid of the city. We have this incredible kind of topography that can actually be read if you know what to look for and have a, have, and have a map uh, and have a map to read it. Um, the, uh, the map that you need to read it is one which is just an understanding of what the geography is and what the topography is. For example, if you stand on top floor of the Desmond building and look north, you can begin to see how all of the trees, which are planted as street trees, um, increase in their growth when their roots are encountering a, uh, a, a dry street bed or a water aquifer underneath. You begin to understand what the water works are, how the topography and the natural elements are working uh, in spite of the grid of the city and built spaces that have been imposed on top of it. Open space in Los Angeles can serve functions that are not necessarily practical or pragmatic. The practical and pragmatic being the freeway, these vast open green spaces, which I guess uh, Bill will be talking about later, and Brenda and, and Jeremy, in that there is this uh, idea that there is a you know, singular function that occur in these open spaces, like transportation, or like the Getty Museum, the um, story of, of, of history, that, you know, the narration of history that can occur in the landscapes. And this will be about the Villa um, Edgar Graham and the story of, of what all those kind of materials were that existed in that one period of time and are replicated with incredible authenticity. The idea about open space and how we treat our public spaces has to do a lot with how we ourselves and how we treat ourselves. And one of the greatest kind of civic gestures is the um, planting of street trees and the cultivation um, of a communal space outside of buildings, either residential or commercial. But it's, it's how we treat those spaces and how we maintain them and how we cultivate them. And um, in many cases, um, not in many cases, in some cases there's tremendous civic pride. In other cases, street trees are seen by certain um, facility management departments is another dirty dish to wash. Um, in other cases, they're seen as an incredible sort of uh, contribution to our um, 
living space outside. What we do with those spaces and how we understand the elements that we have to work with the <coughs> illustrates um, our understanding of the natural elements. The <coughs> early missions, like the mission of San Miguel on the right and the Lake House of Berkeley, which is a um, demonstration of native plant materials that can be used to create a tapestry and also tell a story about the kinds of plant materials that you will know, survive on ambient rainfall. To uh, landscapes that begin to illustrate the, the incredible kind of insensitivity that we have towards um, heat in the desert or towards uh, erosion. It takes a um, British uh, artist, David Hockney, to, in a way, really capture what our understanding is of our natural elements, or Alice Acock uh, in this piece that she has about water. And, uh, also, uh, artists like Astrid Preston, whose landscapes uh, tell the, the narration of a journey or of, a, um, of, of the, the, the story of, of, of a much greater kind of psychological journey. And it's only when we stand back uh, from the maps, when we stand back from the topography, that we can begin to uh, understand and develop another kind of layering or idea about what open spaces are and what they can provide to us in a psychological uh, level. So today what I want to do is to suggest that open spaces can function as a catalyst for the creation of imaginary landscapes as well as social interaction that um, mm -hmm. was talked about in the last uh, panel. And it's these psychological landscapes that can serve as metaphorical processes through which we can be sensitized to the psychological and the symbolic dimensions of our daily lives. In short, the psychological importance of open space may well outweigh their social and economic importance. So far, so good. What, what I'm going to talk to you about this morning um, really has to do with open space as some people experience it. Um, I'm not a designer. I don't know one whit about design. I have no training in elements of design. I like taking pictures, so I understand um, things aesthetic, but the technical uh, sort of uh, abstract situations around design have totally escaped me, and sometimes I'm really glad. <laughs> <laughs> But this is, uh, this is the Los Angeles that a lot of people experience in some way, shape, form, or fashion in their daily lives. This is the Civic Center. This is where uh, people conduct their business, where people go to trial, where they get married, where they record births and deaths. And, um, but this is also Los Angeles. This is the Los Angeles that started to grow up maybe, um, what, 40, 30, 40 years ago now, as I was... Uh, growing up. This is the Los Angeles where the Harbor Freeway ripped in half my whole neighborhood. And this is the Los Angeles that most of us uh, see in the uh, 
lifestyles of rich and famous. But up until the 1940s, Los Angeles was really uh, uh, number one in agricultural production in the United States. And there's still a few of these sort of family farms around, but commercial agriculture is now pretty much relegated to um, the outlying areas in the high desert and uh, bordering Ventura County. So this is more or less what most people think of when they think about Los Angeles, thanks to the media. They think about Peligro, a dangerous place, not safe. And with respect to street trees and greenery, we have whole generations of young people that uh, consider them landscape uh, targets. They, uh, they call it landscape because it's, it doesn't move. Uh, the the taggers, they, they call this getting up, meaning putting their tag up on a stationary object. And so the way that many young people in inner city Los Angeles are experiencing open space is completely disconnected from nature and trees and anything that has to do with anything aesthetic. This is their aestheticism. This is the new aestheticism. One of the things about Los Angeles that was, that, that's also so striking though is its multicultural base. I don't know if you can tell, there's a Mercado here and right next door to it is the Armenian Market. And this is on Santa Monica Boulevard. A lot of examples of, of open space in, in the parts of the world that I move in on a regular basis missing slide. But this is also open space, community vegetable gardens, places where people come together to do something, where they experience uh, community in the literal sense, where they solve problems, where they uh, interact socially, and where barriers of culture and race are, are eliminated. But, you know, this one here, this is, this is kind of a design right here. <laughs> See that it's all structured and lines and classic and you know we got a little few angles going on there so it's kind of a nice shot. But there are no people in this shot. Here are the people. And here are the people. And here are the people. The whole idea of what we do at Common Ground is to basically get people growing food for nutritional purposes. But what we've discovered along the way is that a lot of other things happen while they're out in the open space we come to call the garden. How is this an extension of living space? For some people, the garden is in fact an extension of living space because they live four to five families in a unit and they share beds, they sleep in shifts. And the garden plot is their extension of themselves, a place where they can be contemplative, where they can uh, think about life and times, get a little peace and quiet, and generally um, experience uh, some tranquility that a lot of people take advantage of in, on, in other arenas. But we also have a situation here in Los Angeles where people are starting to de define the landscape in the way they want to. And that is, it's not just street trees, it could be a wildflower patch if it wants to be. And this is where people come together to um, eliminate any sort of suspicion and uh, class differences that exist in the city of Los Angeles. One of the things that happened after the unrest was that um, we tried to articulate to the United States Forest Service and the United States Department of Agriculture that whatever happened had to happen based on what this community wanted to happen. And so what we did was unheard of. We actually asked people to give us some suggestions about design if we were gonna rebuild some parts of this city after the unrest. We had Akva Stein and her students work with us to create some of these sort of fantasies that, that went on. And in this way, a lot of what we're talking about, Sam Hall Kaplan has talked about in terms of retrofitting neighborhoods, regenerating neighborhoods. 
But when it comes to that, um, I like the statement I heard earlier that talked about embracing the, pe the uh, present rather than trying to retrofit to some past image because the neighborhoods are really different now. So this is just a vacant lot. It's still got old Chevrolets on it the last time I looked. But it could be a place where gardening and, and uh, some kind of human interaction with the landscape and the land could take place. A fruit orchard is a good idea in an area where largely commercial landscaping and uh, commercial nurseries have abandoned the inner city. So we're also talking about places where even if people want to do something with their homes or with empty space, they have to go miles and miles and miles to find a nursery or, uh, or a house plant sometimes, unless they pay exorbitant rates at the grocery store, which is pretty much what they do. An extension of living space, a, si a senior citizen's park where people can just sit and um, in the shade on a summer day. The spirit of entrepreneurial, this, this one slide really is the one that affects me the most. Uh, the 187 is the penal code for murder. Everything burned on this corner except the flower store. So another open space use. Why not turn it into sort of a mini commercial area in which vendors could bring carts you know, we got this problem with people wanting to vend all over the sidewalks and clutter up our open space with their ugly stuff. Well, why don't we create something that looks nice but also allows these people to pursue um, what for them is a very natural course of action. A literal extension of open space. We did a survey of a vacant lot south of the 10 freeway to Imperial Highway, east to, I think it was Wilmington Avenue and west to La Cienega. We asked the city to uh, send us a printout of all the vacant lots right after the, the unrest. We got a stack of paper uh, nine inches thick with 2,603 vacant parcels on it. There's plenty of open space in the city of Los Angeles and there is more than enough in the inner city of Los Angeles. What we've tried to do through things like the Urban Green Initiative is bring community-based organizations together to choose their landscape for themselves. And then we've tried to educate them in the technology, the very basic technology of creating these spaces for themselves, working together and learning new skills along the way. There's, this is on Orange Drive and, and Ninth Street. This is an example of urban agriculture. That slide uh, should have been followed by yet another one, but that one uh, sort of bucolic scene is actually at the corner of 76 and San Pedro in the middle of one of the worst gang infested neighborhoods in Los Angeles where there's never been a truce and there isn't one now. But again, open space. This open space is next door to the campus of Fremont High School where they had a thriving at one point in time agriculture education program. In the uh, 60s, they abandoned these kinds of programs. But there are groups of people in South Central taking kids that have dropped out of school and they're regenerating this, this area here. These are kids that are learning to hand weed as an extreme way of teaching them about uh, their relationship to nature and the weeds even have purposes. And besides that, they don't spray chemicals on them.
At Common Ground, we worked with maybe uh, 500 kids over a five-year period of time. Uh, about 75% of them really complained about the labor involved. The girls would show up with their fingernails and their, their things, and the boys would show up with their, their attire, and we'd send them home and say, that tomorrow I'll come with jeans and, t and tennis shoes. And uh, they complained, but at the end, about 75% of these kids at the end, when we would talk to them, would want to come back and work for us next year. And they talked about learning to be connected to plants and, and learning to be connected to themselves and seeing what was happening because they were involved in something. I don't know what that is. Oh, my slides are stuck now. Great. In any event, uh, I'm almost done now, but I think that if I had a message for, for groups of people that design things, is that, you know, when you're designing things, you're designing them for people, for people to interact with. And one of the things that has to happen in Los Angeles is you have to ask the people what they like. That you have to ask the people if your idea and their ideas are compatible, if your idea is the same idea as their idea, and if your idea is different, that's okay too. Here's another one. I took this in the Grand Canyon, not realizing I'd taken a picture of a vacant lot on the same frame. And this is what can happen when design listens to the people. This is a project called Uhuru Gardens. And this, is, this was designed by Professor Arthur Stein. Um, after working with us uh, for a long time, she sent her students out into the community of Watts and they walked around and they looked around and they saw the people and they talked to the people. And they put together a series of small dioramas and brought them in and we had a meeting. There were eight dioramas and the people got to walk around the room and say, well, why does this look like this and what is this about? And, you know, well, which one do you like the best? And they voted on different aspects of this multi-use environmental education and vocational training center. Why that's important is we got dinged a lot by some professional designers. It's like, it's got all this stuff in it. But everything in it is things that people want. There is. A training center. Um, all of these trees and plants will be um, installed by people who are learning a more culture, tree care maintenance, landscape skills. A community vegetable garden. This is the Georgetown Hobby Project over here. So the people that live over there in Georgetown and over there can come and grow food. Um, a market garden up here where uh, they can start to learn entrepreneurial types of uh, activities, a greenhouse for greenhouse operation and maintenance, um, an amphitheater for performance art and junior arts center that we want to have there with environmental education and the theme. So this is all stuff that people in that community came up with and um, they, didn't, they didn't know anything about design either. Um, so I guess my only message to a group like, like this is, is that um, there, it doesn't have to be an argument between um, City Walk and something else. It has to be City, city Walk and a lot of other things. It, there doesn't have to be an argument between the Delta Smelt and, and landscape in the city. It has to be landscape and open space in the city and the Delta Smelt and the wetlands. Um, it, has to, it has to come from building consensus in the communities that we want to talk about in terms of designing or regenerating or rebuilding. And it has to come from an idea that people inherently know what's good for them. They inherently know what they want. And sometimes the skill that you bring is the ability to translate what it is they want and need into something that for them is going to work. And that's really all I have to say.
I think as designers, uh, we have to be good listeners. And uh, in listening to Brenda, who I've known previously because we've worked on uh, a number of things, the Green Network, for example, and I've met her through that, uh, we have to be good listeners. Uh, I think that so often, though, uh, we as designers have to question is, who do we listen to? And uh, I might say this uh, by way of beginning, the project that our office got involved with, which was really an outgrowth of uh, doing some fairly large commercial uh, real estate projects throughout the metropolitan area. And I would say for the last 10 years, and then when the, as Aaron said, as the uh, market began to subside, uh, we had all, during this time, begun to uh, ask questions about things, I think, Internally, uh, we have some fairly headstrong people in the office, and uh, uh, I get my share of licks sometimes. But uh, uh, as we began to do these big commercial projects, quite frankly, we were uh, seemed to be widening streets uh, for more and more traffic uh, to justify uh, intersection capacities to allow for greater and greater densities. And we began to ask ourselves, why can't we just widen the sidewalks for more and more people? And and uh, and addressing this issue of sort of public versus private, um, pu uh, Aaron sort of questions us about whether we truly have public space. I would only sort of say that um, I would oppose it to the private space, I would say, as opposed to private space, because in some ways the, uh, uh, our, our emphasis on privatization in, this, in the city is probably, uh, is probably more, more, most aggressive in the United States and our tradition towards it is, is perhaps one of the strongest. The, uh, what I'd like to just really mention before I go through the slides, and I bet it's my slides down so I can get through in 10 minutes, uh, but uh, is, uh, number one is that uh, we in Los Angeles have a tradition for open space, or I should say landscape. And as Kevin Starr uh, indicated in his uh, uh, beginning speech, and he documented by looking at diaries that were done in the uh, 1700s, the late 1700s and 1800s, is that there was a sort of reference to the horizontal or to the mystical sort of landscape, the distance, view of mountains and that sort of thing. I think that later as we began to urbanize, we began to translate that into a garden city tradition. And quite frankly, this is why people <coughs> liked coming here. There's a sense of, of uh, open, openness about the city. There's a sense of freedom about it. Uh, and I, even you, who come from the East Coast, I think, today, uh, even though it's dramatized by being right at the edge of the ocean and seeing the uh, western uh, uh, view towards the, uh, to the ocean, it's really quite dramatized in the sense that you, you, you are relating to the, the sense of the city. Uh, maybe Pam uh, suggested that the psychological uh, issue, uh, the freedom issue, sense of freedom issue related to the landscape. And I, I say this because I think this is one of our motivating factors, is that uh, as we begin to urbanize, I mean, what is this? We're, are we building ourselves into oblivion? And with the car and all of that, it becomes a, a rather important sort of issue. Uh, the second point is this notion of, of a private city. Paul Goldberger came out here a few years ago and gave a speech at UCLA, and some of us had uh, uh, a few moments with him after he toured the city. And he said something very simple, uh, which caught our attention which was, he said this is a very private city. Uh, private city, what, what did that mean? Um, well, we began to think about it, you realize we have such a tremendous tradition of private homes and private backyards and private cars and private streets now, even though Doug's earlier photographs of Los Angeles in a prior time sort of indicated the civic uh, life about our public areas. Uh, we have, we've withdrawn, we've, we've gone into these private sort of enclaves and there's even a greater tendency with the expansion to Orange County and other places to privatize things. Uh, the fourth thing is that, um, I, oh yes, I think the, the issue of a, in responding to the changing demographics, um, we are a city that was at one time uh, a very, uh, uh, almost two-dimensional in the sense of its Anglo population, although Doug referred to us as having uh, demographic uh, differences and and quite frankly, ethnic differences. Uh, I think uh, we went through a period post-war that we became very anglicized. And, uh, and then only recently, I think, in the last 10 years, we've, we've seen this diversification. We saw it with uh, Peter Morrison, who gave us the presentation on uh, the demographics and the changes of the city, and it's come up on a number of panels. 
But I think as we begin to look at where people live and how they live and the, and the, the, the dwellings that they live in, then the question becomes, uh, you know, the, the size of the family, um, the size of the dwelling. Uh, in, in increasing urbanization, we've talked about the issue of, of, of uh, maybe the single family house is no longer a possibility for everyone. But then you begin to look at what, what alternative you do have for uh, gardening, uh, uh, alternative for recreation. And you begin to realize that, uh, that uh, our city is quite devoid of uh, open space, let's say public open space as opposed to private open space. And we need, if we were to accommodate this changing demographics and population explosion, that we do need to have places. In fact, we took some uh, very uh, shortly after sort of coming off some fairly large projects, we, we did uh, some tabulations uh, and we found that 4% uh, of the surface area of Los Angeles was devoted to, to public parks, so-called public parks. Uh, this is a, uh, it does not include schools, where most of the public schools in Los Angeles are, are, uh, are, are lined with, uh, with chain link fence. So uh, and because of liability reasons, they're not available to the public. public. Um, so 4% of the surface area is devoted to public parks. And then Boston, it was 9%. Uh, San Francisco, close to 9%. Uh, Seattle, uh, 13, almost 14 percent, and uh, lo and behold, uh, uh, Los, uh, uh, New York, which will be seen in the fall, uh, 17 percent. So uh, it, it brings to mind uh, where are we going, and uh, so what I'd like to present today uh, is an idea. Uh, it's an idea about the urban region. Uh, it's uh, a very comprehensive idea that is, involves uh, quite a quite a, a vast sort of uh, a region or uh, area. In fact, it involved roughly the county of Los Angeles, maybe a little bit more. Uh, it uh, it tries to look at residual space that is leftover space, um, and I would say not at the same scale that Brenda uh, talked about, but uh, because uh, well, we looked at uh, she's looking at the neighborhood scale community parks, gardens, organizing communities to do that. We looked at other kinds of residual space, the uh, spaces that, that were left over, particularly uh, for underused uh, rail lines, that is the red car system we had at one time in the, through the 50s, early 50s. We had the largest uh, rail system in this uh, metropolitan area. It was 1,100 miles long, uh, extended uh, Mulde County, uh, and then during the 50s, we uh, obliterated it uh, because of the bus uh, and auto industries here. But today, those res residual spaces exist. They exist, exist throughout the metropolitan area, and they're laying there without any kind of utilization. It's really quite astounding. They connect communities. They border communities. They offer a tremendous opportunity uh, for open space. Uh, the other residual space uh, was the uh, was the L.A. River, and uh, people in this room have worked on studies of the L.A. River, uh, Art Golding here at the Taylor uh, Yards with the AIA and others, and, and Devon Murphy. But uh, the idea of using the, the river as a positive a thread that goes through our communities, and uh, not just the river, but its tributaries. And then finally, the third thing was the, the opportunity of actually using uh, the metro rail system as a, as a way of uh, capitalizing on uh, the, uh, the resources of a hundred and now sixty billion, hundred and sixty billion dollar system and being able to develop some of these opportunities. I, I say opportunities now, in fact, uh, the idea that we'll present today uh, is, uh, is a very opportunistic. It takes what we have but are not using and tries to make something of it. So with that, I'd just like to go through some slides very quickly and uh, to move on. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, this has been designed for uh, a different kind of audience, so we've already covered <laughs> uh, some of the explanation. But uh, very quickly, uh, you, sort of ideas about what Los Angeles uh, is uh, were expressed early in the, uh, the turn of the century. The, in 1913, a, a view of what uh, some uh, designer, which is, knew his name, her name, 
but uh, there's something about downtown Los Angeles. Uh, you can almost see the Biltmore Hotel in there. Uh, obviously, they, they had some idea about transit and a very kind sort of idea about automobiles uh, in the sense that they could drive through buildings and that sort of thing. Later on in the 20s, we had, uh, we began, uh, actually Kevin talked about this. He talked about the innate landscape, but he also talked about uh, the importation of various kind of models or ideas about what the city could be. And this is a, a drawing that was done in, in 1923 at uh, Wilshire Boulevard and Western. And there are buildings like what you see on either side of the drawing there. Uh, what is it, the Talmadge and I uh, can't remember some of the others. But anyway, uh, if you go down uh, 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 Wilshire Boulevard today in this area, so there, there, were, there were aspects of this that, that came out of it. But it's an idea of Park Avenue, really. It's at the New York Street. It's an idea about density. And this is the boulevard of our city. And then later in the, um, in the uh, 60s, there began to be ideas of uh, certain kinds of urban utopias, which are quite absurd today. And thank God they didn't get built, but they were sort of uh, designer ideas of, of megastructures. And, and, uh, and this happens to be, if you can see the slide on the left, is Park La Brea with uh, the towers there that were done in, uh, at the beginning Actually, they began at the beginning of the war and completed afterwards. But the uh, the whole idea of, of some kind of a, of a highly controlled uh, mechanistic society, and uh, we move move on to other kinds of other kinds of models. And one way we began to look at other kinds of models, and and we do this in in our office a lot with our urban design planning projects. And maybe it's because we're in Los Angeles and not in the East Coast, but we look at the landscape. Uh, and in, in doing so, we look through uh, the artist's eyes and uh, we look to them for the intangible things, the psychological things about what's so appealing about the landscape and why it's so important to us and why we're here in many ways. Uh, the paintings, uh, painting on the left is a, painter, a painting by uh, Elmer Wachtel. Uh, it's a painting of the valley. And uh, although eucalyptus trees are not uh, indigenous to our, uh, our area, they're certainly within the climatic zone that supports it. Uh, they're natives of, uh, of Australia and have become almost indigenous here. But the hedgerows and the, and, uh, and the beauty of those hedgerows become rather important. Uh, just the quality of light, the, the artist, uh, the, the white light. We were said, it was said to be a city of white light. And although uh, a winter day like this, it's, it's like uh, quite amazingly uh, clear and, and beautiful. Uh, about nine months of the year, it's very much a white light kind of environment. Uh, Dave Hockney, in his, in his painting, uh, part, his partial of his painting, uh, Mulholland Drive, talks about, or uh, visualizes, I should say, uh, the landscape, and in essence, the mountains, uh, the valleys, the river. You can see all the elements of, and even the power lines, which go between uh, communities and, uh, and provide opportunities for linkage. Wayne Tabot and his, uh, Paintings later uh, is pretty interesting. Deals with cars and the, the everyday life, and, and and the one on the right I, I like particularly because he, he begins to take the auto uh, mania to its extreme, where the 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 the, the car and its and its uh, artery simply disengages from the land use, and it, it almost goes into it, or it does go into entire in, in, you know into the tremendous chaos and. Uh, Cars, cars, and uh, uh, with our uh, with our uh, sort of uh, relentless link to the Pacific Rim, and uh, these are pictures taken in the harbor, where we're the largest port now in the United States, and the port of entry of more cars. And uh, in our tradition of promenade, I have to say, and I, I remember growing up uh, in Los Angeles here, and and, uh, and and the wonderful sort of freedom that existed, in, in just promenading with the kids, uh, in this case Hollywood Boulevard, and the on the right, uh, uh, this gets kind of it gets kind of uh, rankous at times, but uh, but it is our promenade. Uh, people identify with cars and, and that sort of thing. And then returning to the landscape again, the issue of the landscape, uh, we have a uh, William Wynn on the left. Uh, we had a wonderful period of painting in the uh, late 1800s, uh, early uh, 19, uh, 19th, uh, 20th century. Uh, it was a uh, very romantic. Period. It almost it translated some of these values into paintings. Uh, it was a plein air paintings. The uh, slide uh, on the uh, slide on the right it really shows you how 
the uh, LA River, the river basins began to be channelized, not by urbanization and cars, but by agriculture. And uh, uh, all of it was parcelized, and particularly the valley, the orange groves, and, and it, you know, the rivers become uh, much more reduced in their breadth, and uh, essentially capt capturing the areas for more and more productive agricultural purposes. And then later, the same kind of grid that was established becomes uh, the basis for subdivisions and cars. And in these subdivisions, then, the promotion of the single-family house, especially since the Second World War and the development of the private backyard, uh, this swimming pool in, a, uh, uh, in, in an area that doesn't necessarily promote water, it has to import it uh, actively, and the barbecue. And um, that's, uh, that is a tradition, and people enjoy it. But it's at the expense of something else. Our only public promenade in the city, I would say public promenade in the sense that it connects large, link, uh, large areas, that is, from one side of the metropolitan area to the other, uh, is the beach. We're on it here. It's the uh, people do come out here. They celebrate life on it. Uh, in fact, as we leave here, uh, you'll have an opportunity to see in front of the hotel, I'm sure, quite an active promenade. Uh, it's the same one that extends all the way from Palos Verdes to nearly to Malibu, so over 20 miles. The map on, the, uh, on your right is a map of all the public parks in the, in the metropolitan area. Uh, it's very interesting to note that in South Central, in this area in here, there's very little green area uh, at all. Uh, Griffith Park, which is actually a wonderful park, is full of the basin up here. Uh, and then the blue line is the L.A. River that extends up through the valley and beyond. This is the 4% that we talked about. The L.A. River, a, a very formidable engineering feat, I have to say, and uh, in many ways it was, it was done. Uh, it, at one time it actually extended, had a much broader breadth. You can see the bridges actually constructed to allow for a more, uh, a much further expansion and as, as the almighty dollar began to claim uh, more need, at least no more and more land, for productive use or whatever, uh, it began to infill and this kind of cross-section was created. So we looked uh, at how you might uh, identify those elements that were continuous through the city. So very quickly we had the freeway, the grid system itself, power lines, uh, the flood channel and rail lines. And of course the rail system. Uh, this is the map on the left there. Uh, Kate Diamond mentioned uh, in, in the process we did a study of the rail system and actually mapped it for the first time, locating each, uh, uh, each terminal, each uh, line segment. And then we did a, a map called Hits and Misses and we found uh, eight hits and 32 misses. Sorry. And then uh, the residual uh, un underutilized rail lines, many of which were the red car system throughout the metropolitan area. And one on the, the slide on the right happens to be one that goes through Watts, the Watts Towers. And then a concept that we developed, which is taking some of them, by no means all of them, and uh, trying to, to, to figure out a way to actually link, essentially, uh, the beach to the mountains, uh, the national parks being up in here, uh, and the beaches in this area. And uh, in doing so, oops, let me go back here. Began to, to capture this idea of landscape again by building into this idea, uh, the hedge row. So in essence, wrong button, you began to, to relate the mountains to the water. So one of the first things we did is we went out, and, uh, before doing the plan, we actually went out and began to, to look at uh, these areas. And one of the things we found is that uh, some of these areas were actually had been improved. For example, the rail, uh, the abandoned rail line in Redondo Beach here, which is the red car line, uh, if you walk 400 yards, turn around, walk 400 yards in the opposite directions, enter Hermosa Beach, you find that 
the rail line continues through Hermosa and Manhattan Beach. And in fact, the, the neighborhoods there uh, use it. Uh, they plant it. They maintain it. They police it. Uh, and they are the reasons why it exists, not because, because some overriding authority built it because they wanted it and they, they built it. Now, it so happens along these lines, there's also the city hall and uh, there's the libraries, uh, the schools, and other public services that existed at the time of the red car. And in many, many of the cases, the civic centers are located at, uh, next to the, uh, these lines. And the Royal Parkway in Pasadena, between Pasadena and Los Angeles, these greenways, they don't need to be greenways, they can be brownways, but this exists, which is very much part of the community. It's a promenade in areas where uh, the people walk their dogs and recreate. Uh, these are some shots then in Watts, the community, the opportunity of creating community gardens, uh, many of which could be uh, much along the lines of Brenda's presented. And uh, in Europe, we see these, uh, these kinds of gardens uh, along rail corridors everywhere. Pasadena. This is Maywood in East Los Angeles. Soccer fields. This happens to be in uh, Century City, Santa Monica Boulevard. You can see how well the rail corridors have been treated, you know, with garbage and, and uh, signage, commercial. This is Huntington Park. This is Northeast Los Angeles. And finally, uh, we start on art and we'll end on art, is that uh, uh, the paintings of, of Carlos Amarez, who unfortunately died a few years ago, but is a wonderful Latino painter. Uh, the, we hope that this is kind of the, the end of an era, the smashing of cars, and uh, the same painter uh, presented uh, uh, Echo Park here, which is absolutely beautiful, a painting of the public, say, so-called public open space. Thank you. me to address the idea of space in Los Angeles from the point of view, which calls itself a spatial metaphor, of the kind of art which uh, that space has produced or, or made possible. I think I can uh, best do that by describing the space of Los Angeles as I see it and then relating that to what I see as its impact on certain art practices. I'm going to do that in the most general terms, both um, of necessity and by design uh, of necessity, because I'm going to do it without slides, but the work I'm going to discuss being particularly resistant to photography. And by design, because I want to discuss this question in terms which might make it in some way relevant to the theme of, of this panel. Uh, that is to say, I want to address the question of public space, but in doing so, I feel obliged to say first that it is not uh, clear that the visual arts can really address this question at all in the sense that works of visual art, uh, while publicly exhibited, uh, always offer or point to uh, another visual metaphor an essentially private uh, experience. They are, that is to say, things we look at silently and without recourse to the experiences of those around us, and which we tend to regard as articulations constructed around the idea <coughs> of the perception and cognition of an individual subject. Works of visual art, in other words, tend to point away from the idea of the group or the collective in both their origin and their address. And in this sense, they point away from the idea of the public, uh, despite uh, that being where they live. As I understand it, we're interested here in space as something that gets left over. Space as that which is displaced, uh, as well as uh, 
space which uh, connects. From the point of view of the visual arts, this is the old fantasy of representation. One must have space in order that one may have the thing, the, the idea of space as supplement used to suppress, contain, and deny. The idea of space as that which had to be there first. The repression of form is this by form, whereby the latter denies its origins in the former. There would be on this panel, Aaron uh, told me, and <coughs> as we've seen, uh, those who would want to talk about public space as something which should be made horticulturally or agriculturally productive, so that agricultural production would fill in the space between uh, the gaps between industrial and commercial production and the residential production of producers. Cultivated spaces linking the spaces of culture then, but in a way which would go further than the relatively conservative uses of greenery that one finds in some European cities. Others, uh, Aaron said, would want to propose that one talk about the space which commerce can't colonize uh, as an interconnected tissue, and in the spaces, space whose identity was exclusively or fundamentally one of transition, an indeterminate shifter which existed primarily only to point towards that which it was not, the space as index and as supplement, or as supplement as index. I think that that is, of course, what public space is in late uh, capitalism, except that one would want in saying that um, uh, to closely examine the relation between the indexical space and the space to which it pointed with the possibility in mind, uh, as always, that it might be the former which inflects the latter, rather than, uh, as various forms of contemporary utopian positivism would have it, uh, the other way around. That is, the space of non-production might inflect the space of production rather than uh, we go where Which brings me back to my topic, which is the outside space of Los Angeles considered as a phenomenon rather than, uh, as in the case of these other interests, a scene of socio-cultural production. It is, of course, not really possible to keep this to a part, and I, I shan't make any attempt to do so. This said, uh, I should describe the space of LA, the space around and behind and between these objects which comprise Los Angeles, as an inherently classical space, at once limitless and banal, bounded and clear, extending to the horizon unimpeded by the fog or mist which brings romanticism. Its banality is, in fact, a function of its clarity in being uninterrupted it is a sign for that homogeneity which classicism identifies with harmony. It offers a space which pretends to neutrality, bordered on the one side by the ocean and elsewhere by mountains, a pleasing balance between extension into fluidity and verticality as a limit. This is the space within which Los Angeles takes place, or which the space of Los Angeles displaces. And this is, of course, uh, where it immediately becomes difficult to separate the phenomenal from the sociocultural, because it is as an interaction between these two that one tends to read the art produced in response to that space. For instance, uh, the first thing that one wants to do with the limpid and uninterrupted space of the classic is to qualify it without rendering it opaque, to impose on it a perspective which will preserve its continuity. It is thus that the classic believes itself to be founded in nature. And I should relate Frank Gehry's use of uh, chain link or Robert Irwin's use of translucent scrim, uh, which I've already, which I've wanted elsewhere to refer to as the chiffon effect, uh, to such a desire. In both cases, one is given an aesthetic of division which maintains the idea of extension. One is given it, moreover or however, I'm not sure which, to an aesthetic of fragility, which is where, it seems to me, the sociocultural seems to re-emerge or flow back in. Uh, fragility is, after all, a feature of Los Angeles. Uh, quite apart from the earthquake question and the tendency of bits of the city to wash away whenever we get a particularly heavy shower, uh, Los Angeles 
has about it that air, a spatial metaphor again, of the bleached and the baked, which is characteristic of deserts, but which is in Los Angeles metonymically or dialectically accompanied by greenery, which is itself nature functioning as a sign of the triumph of the industrial. It is a city which transports waters from hundreds of miles away and in which all the cars always appear to have been recently <coughs> washed. The lavatory of excess as a sign of nature's repression. Where other cultures paraded their possession of fire, Los Angeles trumpets its possession of water. And this is, of course, also the case in Saudi Arabia, where they're very proud of their golf courses. It is in these terms that I, I think, then, uh, that I think that um, Frank's chain link or Bob uh, Owen Chiffon is worth thinking about in terms of a spatial articulation <coughs> with regard to how it's articulated and in terms of the referential and conventional identity of, of what it's articulated with. In both cases, it is with a material which is the opposite of massive or heavy and is inherently manipulable. The work contains within its own materiality, that is to say, the idea of the ephemeral, or of the almost not there. It is, I think, uh, this resistance to the idea of the massive which most directly links the Los Angeles, the art of Los Angeles, to its context. One never returns here from Europe or New York without noticing the lack of heaviness in virtually everything. Norman Bryson, our historian, has said of Fragonard that in his paintings even the ground is filled with air. <coughs> and this seems generally true of both the best and the most boring art and architecture made in this city and its environment. Gary, again, could provide examples, columns which are oversized but pneumatic rather than monumental in the effect they create, an exterior staircase of the Loyola Law School which plays with perspective in a way which allows it to use the idea of motion to undermine one's sense of its solidity, or Irwin again, with works which exist to try to disappear, uh, which, uh, which are lit in such a way that the light around them seems more substantial than the object it illuminates. The boring uh, versions of this are to be found, uh, obviously, especially in the horrifying corporate architecture of Orange County, and um, in the not very good work of so many California artists who have become lost in the idea of clarity as a kind of flawlessness, but having that managed to confuse the idea of the flawless with what looks like an idea of the perfect as something which is very clean, a kind of Baptist-inflected conflation of the <laughs> idea of goodness with that of the healthy. There's also, uh, parenthetically, uh, a nascent tradition of anti-fragility in Los Angeles. Uh, the artist Chris Burden is perhaps its spiritual leader. It, it seems uh, to me uh, to amount to an entirely Puritan protest against the hedonistic possibilities inherent in the environment. And I liken it to a point made years ago uh, to me in conversation by Kurt Forster. Kurt um, commenting on the prevalence of Marxist humorlessness in California's art history departments made the point that it was obvious that surrounded by heaven on earth, it would of course be necessary for the critical mind to demonstrate and in that justify its criticality by working even harder to find out what was wrong with the place. It burden and his followers seem to feel it their duty to maintain the idea of the brutal in the presence of the ephemeral and the delicate, and he has a significant number of followers. But it is uh, to the idea of fragility, or actually to the idea of the flawless, as the other side of the idea of the fragile, uh, to which I want to return now in, in closing. And this also returns us to the idea of the car wash. John Barbasari explained to me years ago, when I first arrived here, that one of the things that made it possible for people to make such a fuss about their cars in LA uh, was that it doesn't rain here, and therefore cars don't get rusty. They just fade slightly, like works of art. <laughs> uh, the observation seems to me useful in thinking about the tendency of LA's art to be concerned with the air filled, the light, 
and lightness itself. Useful in that it leads to the thought that the flawless is a way of suggesting the timeless, or time without negation. Time without the traces of time. Time frozen or time maintained. Time without change. This would be analogous to the idea of space undefined by the objects which fill and displace and redefine it. And it leads me to want to suggest that the art of those in Los Angeles who study its light and space, Irwin and Terrell, or among younger artists, uh, Linda Hudson or Diana Theta, is an art of preservation rather than of construction. It seeks to maintain the space proposed by the light and the terrain rather than to replace it with something which will occupy it. It is an art which is phenomenally engaged, but it is the engagement between the phenomena and that which recaptures and restates it which engages art. And this leads me to a final point. No one who was not born in LA can, I should think, disassociate it from the movers. And this is true of its light and space. Other cities contain symbolic structures which we've known about uh, before we go there, and then we get to see them. the Parthenon, the Altus Museum, Notre Dame, whatever it is. LA is filled with a light which we've seen hundreds of times and which we finally get to see when we come here, get to occupy when we come here. In this sense, the light of Southern California has, for most of us, never had a purely phenomenal identity. It has always been already symbolic, representational rather than present, and replete with content rather than a neutrality in which content might emerge or into which it might be injected. Perhaps that has something to do with the urge to preserve it. It doesn't require conversion to become the space of the pleasurable. It already stands for the pleasurable, for pleasure. There is, in other words, nothing not to like. In such a situation, preservation seems the logical way to go, albeit one in which, by definition, one could have only the vaguest idea of what it was that one preserved. Thank you. Spaces that change and grow uh, are more spontaneous spaces. Uh, I think a comprehensive, uh, comprehensively developed plan is one in which it's a very difficult plan to, to achieve in, in Los Angeles, I'd have to say. I think neighborhoods are very stratified and they, they tend to want to do their own plans. I know that in our, our, our work uh, in, in talking with neighborhood uh, groups uh, with regard to the open space plan you saw was that many uh, felt that they they wanted to take charge of what they have in their community and a comprehensive overview is a very difficult one and one that may not be uh, totally feasible within the, the context of the city and how we deal with things. So. 
Um, um, my other reaction is that um, even as we speak, there have been these um, community planning meetings going on all over Los Angeles, We're talking about a, uh, the Los Angeles master plan, if, if such a thing could, could exist. Um, what's unfortunate in my mind is that um, things like the landscape are often the last things that um, that get discussed on these agendas. And, and so, however, um, open space and, and landscape and green spaces is, is going to be articulated, it's going to continue to be an afterthought um, if we don't have a way to um, advance uh, the notion of space and functionality um, and articulate that argument differently. Well, Brenda, I think that there were a number of successive plans, you know, dealing with the organization of open space in Los Angeles, starting with Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. in the 1920s, developing his famous plan of, of the Green Fingers, meaning the canyons and the undevelopable areas which have tremendous topography to serve in a way as lungs for the city. That's sort of the idea. And then, of course, and then in the 50s and 60s, Garrett Ekbo with his sort of plan of open spaces and, the, and the, the way in which uh, they would uh, relate to one another. And then, of course, now we've got the, the sort of Greenways project where the connective tissue is somehow put together, which is not really even orchestrated as a, you know, major kind of political effort. It was, it was, a, it was a, something that was developed on, in, in the private world as, in, in terms of an old private interest in a way. Well, but as opposed to in our case, it was it was a summary really of a, of a number of, of organizations and their interests in, in doing things. And all we did is we just we did a little bit more, but we did uh, draw draw it up essentially. Well, it's sort of um, optimistic thinking uh, that perhaps in light of the recent um, seasons that we have in Los Angeles, all converging within two months, uh, mudslides, earthquake, uh, flood, and soon to come drought, <laughs> yeah. that maybe that in light of all of this, the fires, in light of all of this, there might be some way in which uh, open space will begin to take on a new meaning and a new kind of symbolic resonance in the sense that it could even become part of a development of a hazard plan uh, for Los Angeles, where people go in light of disaster. Yeah, what, good point. You know, and there's a whole other way of looking at open mm -hmm. space. Are we, getting, are we getting a little carried away in this kind of image of this romantic college Los Angeles? Uh, isn't the reality of open space more about Hockney's 34 parking lots and uh, the grid and the streets that still make up the reality of the city? Well, that, I, I'm so, as, as would have become clear to everybody here, I don't know very much about architecture, but it, one of the things that that I think is fascinating, in a sense, about this is that obviously anything you do in Los Angeles is artificial. And nothing's more artificial than growing things in the desert. So, so it really is sort of oasis adjustment that we're, we're talking about in some sense. And, and I suppose I continue to think, and, some of you will know I'm writing a book, which is a sort of comparison of LA and, and other cities uh, with regard to the construction of a model of the late capitalist mind as a kind of passive aggression that's called Born to be Mild. Um, <laughs> it, it, it does seem to me that the central sort of thematic principle of Los Angeles is the freeways and that um, this sort of uh, ultra, ultra sort of Paratista model of, of the individual in her or their home in <coughs> some dreadful suburb and then driving on the freeway to some corporate building in some other dreadful suburb. And that is life in Los Angeles. And so I wonder whether one ought not to be thinking, whether my colleagues here ought not to be addressing the question of what the public space that they want to construct or inflect or remodel is for. Like, what is it supposed to do? Is it supposed to get people out of their houses or off the freeways? It's for, you, you obviously know what it's for. It's supposed to bring people together in some sense. It seem, does seem to me, and I, I'm not thinking very clearly about this, but, uh, but it does seem to me that the, it's no accident 
that we think of public space in Los Angeles as space that's left over. And the, the, um, mm -hmm. the kinds of thinking which I'm hearing about it involve really the conversion of something which has been left over into something which has a place, as it were, in, inside the, the system. And I wonder, can you, without, you know, central planning, really propose uses for such spaces? I don't know. If I can just, um, I, I do know what open space ought to be for anyway, even if I don't know what, what actually ultimately happens with it. Um, but this whole notion of Los Angeles, as, as uh, you call it, um, one of the things that uh, someone reminded me is that many of the uh, folks who came to Southern California in, in the number of immigrant waves that we've had uh, beyond those who came from other countries, or even some of those who came from other countries, came from places where there were um, lawns and trees and um, wisteria and uh, greenery, and they were trying to create, recreate that here as, as they brought Kansas and Nebraska and Alabama and wherever they came from, as they brought their experiences and what they find to be beautiful and what they find to be acceptable, they brought those notions with them, and that, as much as anything, as much as the uh, uh, real estate speculation drove the way that we um, articulate what's green space in, in Los Angeles now, and what we appreciate to meet to, uh, green space to be. But there's a difference between green space and open space, and open space doesn't always have to be green. Um, and, and that's something that uh, more and more we're starting to talk about in terms of growing things in a desert. Um, uh, in terms of what uh, what open spaces uh, ought to be for is they ought to be places where people can uh, knit together some sort of a fabric uh, uh, for community. Uh, they ought to be uh, places like the plazas are in, in some cities in Europe where people go and, and they'll do anything. They drink coffee and they read a newspaper. Um, and that's not so much a vision of, uh, of uh, sort of bucolic existence in my mind as much as it, as it is a way to mend the human spirit here in Los Angeles. Um, uh, we do have gated enclaves. Um, some of those photos you saw of development, people came here in the um, 40s, 50s, and 60s, not with uh, the intention of putting down their roots and, and creating community and giving something back. Uh, some of them came in the go-go 80s to uh, make their living and build gated enclaves and not give anything back. Some of those people have fled to Seattle and Santa Fe and everywhere, now talking about how horrible Los Angeles is and taking no responsibility for the fact that they created the place. Um, so my, my attitude about open space and, and is that it belongs to the public. Uh, my attitude about open space is that vacant lots are an abomination and there ought to be uh, regulation about them much the same as there are about um, mm -hmm. bordellos and crack houses. If you own a piece of vacant property in Los Angeles, you should not be allowed to let that property deteriorate. You should have to take care of it. Uh, so do you those mean by that cultivated? Do you mean by that? Cultivated yourself? Let it become public domain. Let somebody else take care of it do whatever but not allow whole neighborhoods to deteriorate, uh, creating a sense of uh, low self-esteem in the people who live there, creating uh, economic uh, inequities in terms of how much um, land values and housing values appreciate. You build a house in uh, Mar Vista in 1940, that house is worth somewhere uh, close to half a million dollars. You build the same house on uh, 59th and Normandy, where my grandson lives, that house is worth $180,000, maybe. Uh, so those are the kinds of things that, uh, uh, and, and the use of open space and, uh, and the deterioration of open space in inner cities is, is what's contributing to, to some of this. So that's my attitude about what it would be useful. And a question over here. Uh, we've gone through five panels in the last couple of days talking about Los Angeles direction of open space in particular. And in the whole two days, I haven't heard anybody say anything about play. About what? Play. Play. Uh, oh. Play. Play. 
Do you mean the follow up? What do you what do you yeah. mean by play? Well, how do you define it? Well, um, simple things like playing softball or playing games or the playground or uh, I don't know, maybe it's the farm's work. Did you hear House of Rising speak last night? Yeah. You talked about soccer too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you see the bash? Well, I don't well, know I think we take a look at green spaces as providing the, the opportunity for, for recreation, whether that's passive recreation or active recreation. Active recreation could be thought of in the sense of play, soccer, football, basketball, um, rollerblading, any of these other activities that are, that, are, that are more active. But I think it's a combination of, of allowing space, what is recreation, but recreating oneself in, in body and in mind. And so I think that looking at open space in the sense that it can offer options for, for both, both of those uh, activities. I, I think the, uh, at least in the, in the uh, network plan, is that the, the idea about open space is that you have activities in it. I mean, you just have to have it. Otherwise, it, it, open space becomes, uh, it has the potential of becoming a divider, a separator. Uh, we know that as urban designers, and I, I think the uh, whether it's urban agriculture or uh, it's something that relates to world soccer, the soccer movement in this town is phenomenal, uh, and it's hard to find uh, soccer fields in this town because the schools are all closed on the weekends. There are a few open for some reason. I'm not quite sure how they worked out their deal, but uh, but uh, so uh, you know the issue of open space is is you know what happens in it is a rather critical issue and i think aaron alluded to that at the beginning and some of the the resistance or the criticisms uh, the, or the comments that we've had about open space and open space planning is the issue of crime for example uh, and how do you uh, how do you uh, protect the community by providing a place where uh, p people in their uh, recreation uh, are gang members and the uh, drug addicts and that sort of thing. And uh, I, in, in sort of answering, I'm asking my own question, I guess, here, but in sort of uh, answering this, I think uh, we have to have a hope, you know, that the hope being that, that uh, the communities have an opportunity of making something out of those spaces if you can somehow find them and create a forum to create them. Uh, and then once they discover this opportunity, then the, the opportunity is there to police in, this, in essence, to, to take charge and to manage their own sort of definition of community, use as a, as a focal point for organizing and becoming a, a part, of making, establishing and defining a community. I think what you're saying, uh, Bill, in a way, is mm -hmm. that it doesn't really work unless it's 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 from a specific group of people who live and work specific area. I, I mean, I, there's yeah, I, I think I think it does. I think Pam, I, I think it does. I think it, at, at its best, it survives and prospers if if you can if that can be if that can be achieved. I think the the issue of a, a network that goes much beyond much more beyond a community it goes you know is metropolitan wide, which is really quite an ambitious one. Uh, it, it, it requires a different, another kind of sort of supplement to that. But I think the origin of the success of it will reside at the, at the lowest common denominator, and it is in the community, and it, it's the vesting empowerment of those communities uh, that uh, will, will really be the success of the open space, I think. I'm, I'm thinking about a recent project that we were involved in where a, um, in fact, one of the oldest Department of Water and Power uh, reservoirs that was a covered reservoir had to be converted to uh, a 30, 30 million gallon uh, tank uh, it, for, earth, for seismic reasons. And um, the uh, community uh, opposition, I mean, there were two groups of people that were there to approve these plans for the DWP. And they were absolutely at complete opposites of the spectrum. The group of people who did not want the, uh, the area that was left over by the reservoir that would be landscaped by DWP turned into recreational ball fields because they didn't want the drugs and the crime. And there were the other groups, which were the ASYO, the American Youth Soccer League, and the people who needed playing fields, saying that they've now got to bust their people to other fields in order to go and play. And no one sort of really wanted to take responsibility. And these huge community meetings with the uh, officers from the area there, mm -hmm. people representing the uh, Department of Parks and Recreation, people re representing the political entities, and there was no consensus on any, on any uh, group.
groups part. And so the idea of uh, recreation and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm getting desperate signals here from the, uh, from the organizers that, that we have to cut this short because everyone ran late, which is sort of a shame. So maybe um, we can extend this discussion into the reality by getting on the buses and, and seeing all the spaces in Los Angeles. And I would, uh, would urge you, as you look at Los Angeles, to try and understand the city as its spaces represent both the economic and social characteristics yeah. of this second largest yeah. economy. Yeah. 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 And, and get a lot of you say, I need it. I need it back. The, uh, so I the grow grow landscape that kind of is created to uh, 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 the that the space that we have to replace yeah. with all of our Piece built of it, uh, efforts. So I'd like to thank the members of the panel. I just remember, I remember, um, uh, well, I remember some of the slides that uh, I could have done. Uh, you know, uh, um, let me explain some logistical things about the tour, and of course, really strongly encourage everyone to come to really knit this together. Yeah. It, it's either fantasy or reality as you take